Matthew chapter 25. One aspect of who God is, his characteristics or his attributes, is this attribute of justice. This attribute of justice means that God demands holiness and that God in his holiness and in his being will require holiness. And God in his justice, just like in life as we know it, we can sense when something's not fair or right, when something is wrong. And we feel like it's right for there to be justice for something that is wrong. And this is because we as human beings, being made in the image of God, we have a, a sense of God's own justice. This attribute of justice that God possesses, he is a just God. This attribute of justice is a, an, an attribute that oftentimes we as human beings, we don't like that part of God. We don't like that aspect of who he is because God's justice demands some sort of personal accountability and responsibility. And therefore, it's easy as human beings to overlook the justice of God and only embrace the grace and the mercy of God. But one should not be granted at the expense of the other. God's grace and mercy are attributes that are equally a part of God as his justice is. And so as we look at these things, in particular, to balance out our understanding of who God is, we have to have a right understanding of the justice of God. And as we do that, we can look through the Bible and see because of the justice of God, that throughout mankind there have been judgments. So we can look back and see judgments. Can you think of any judgments that the Bible may have referred to? Any of, any of you? The flood, that's a good one. Sodom and Gomorrah, that's a good one. Those are, those are judgments that have occurred. Very good, by the way. Good job. Those were judgments that occurred. And see, we see these judgments. So we see, we mentioned the flood. So the whole world was judged by God at one time through the flood. We mentioned Sodom and Gomorrah, which was a city that was judged by God. We see that the nation of Israel was judged by God. Through, you, through the instrument of the Babylonian Empire and also through the Assyrian Empire, we see that Jesus himself received judgment because he was taking our place on the cross. We see the justice of God that has to deal with the unrighteousness. And in the scripture, then we have down the quarter of time pointing forward, we have judgment that is ahead. And as sure as judgment has occurred in the past, judgment will occur in the future. And so there are still different judgments ahead. The Bible speaks about a judgment that will occur in a period known as the tribulation period. That's future. There will be a judgment on the earth in the tribulation period. The Bible also speaks of a future judgment at the end of the tribulation period before the thousand year reign of Christ on earth. And then the Bible speaks of a final judgment called the great white throne judgment. 
And that is the once and for all judgment. So Jesus in our text today, actually in chapters 24 and 25, this is his last sermon before he is taken and crucified. And in his last sermon, we can actually call it the sermon or the message of the second coming. And the disciples knew about this. And the disciples were questioning Jesus. As we begin, began in, in chapter 24 of Matthew, the disciples in Jesus' last few days of his life on earth before his crucifixion and then his resurrection, they're, they're asking him, what will be the sign of you coming and when will these things be? What will be the sign and when will these things be? And this launched Jesus into this explanation of his second coming. When, when is it going to be and, and what are the signs? And he explained that. And the disciples understood and this, this part of his sermon was particularly to the disciples. Felt like Mike Pence there for a second. <laughs> this is particularly to the disciples. And they were wondering because, because they wanted Jesus to set up his kingdom on earth. And they know, knew that what went along with that was judgment. And so as he's explaining these things and he's uh, teaching them about his second coming, the message really that we see coming through is not so much when it's going to happen, but to make sure you're ready for when it's going to happen. And that's the message. And so in this message, Jesus is urging his disciples that the most important thing, knowing that there will be a, a future judgment, the most important thing is that you're ready that you're prepared for it. And he's explaining how to be ready for that. So as sure as we can look past in the past history and see different judgments, the historical record that bears witness to God's judgment upon the earth, that we know for sure there's a future judgment ahead. And so the the biggest question of life is are we ready for that moment are we ready for judgment day are we understanding that there will be that time that that this is real and this is the most important thing and and when one is facing that moment there will be no do-overs it'll be too late to change your position at this time and what we do right now will determine how we will face that judgment day. And so Jesus now, he's pressing this point home. And remember, this is the last part of the last sermon before Jesus is taken and crucified. You might say in this sermon of the second coming, this, this would be like his fourth point or his conclusion. This would be the, the pressing of this urgency to, to make sure that we're right with God. So as we talk about Judgment Day, the key is to know what God says about it and to make sure that we're ready for it. And as we do that, and as we have the confidence to face that day, we can actually look forward to that day. Now I have to give a little framework for us to understand what's going on here. The framework that we're looking at is the particular judgment. This is not the final great white throne judgment. But this is the judgment that's going to occur at the end of the tribulation period. This is the judgment that's going to determine who goes into the millennial kingdom. This is a, a judgment that, that will happen to those who are still on the earth during that seven-year period. 
And those who are on the earth during that seven year period will not be the church. So we have to understand this is not the church. Why is this not the church? The church will be raptured before this happens. So the church will be taken out. Now, as the church is taken out, what God, God then begins to do during this 70 or a seven year period that Daniel refers to, this seven year period, what happens is now God is directly dealing with the nation of Israel. See, at the time, the specific time that we're looking at in our text, when Jesus was giving this message, the nation of Israel has rejected him. Not individuals, not individual participants of the nation of Israel, not individual Jews, but the nation has rejected him as the Messiah. And because of that then, Jesus begins to work in a way where he works through what we know as the church. That's important to our framework to understand this because the church was birthed in Acts chapter 2 in what is known as Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon all those who would believe. So the church would be made up of Jews and Gentiles, or non-Jews, those who would believe. So the distinction would be anybody who would believe in God, they would immediately be filled with the Holy Spirit which would be a seal and a sign of their belonging to God. So the church was birthed, and then God began to work in and through the church by the Holy Spirit. The church would be an instrument that God would use to reach the world with the gospel that, so that the world would know who God is and come to faith in God and be a child of God. We are in that period now. So we, we are in what is called the church age. The church age will end when the church is taken out in the rapture. And when the church is taken out in the rapture, you may be saying, what's the rapture? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, it describes the rapture as an event where the church or those who are believers in Jesus Christ across the whole world in one moment will be taken up into the heavens with Christ. And they, we, will remain there for seven years and then we'll come back at the end of the tribulation, but that's important because now we start to understand more and more what the tribulation is all about. You might want to look at it in two ways. One, it's about God's judgment, God's righteous, and He will judge the earth, and He will do it through a series, series of events that you can read about in Revelation chapter 6 through 19. But see, at the end of that seven year period, that's what we're looking at today. He's going to come back, and then he will decide who's going into the millennial kingdom. So this is the judgment that we're looking at. Now the significance of this is what's important to understand. Our fate for eternity will be determined and will be sealed on earth before we meet our final destination. So God has given us the time on earth to decide where we will spend eternity. Once we're in eternity, we won't get a chance to do that. It'll be done. So whether we die now and face judgment, as the book of Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says it is appointed man once to die then comes judgment 
So that judgment means, regardless of the judgment that we will face in the future, for the, for the believer, as we receive Jesus Christ now, those future judgments won't affect us at all because we've already decided through our faith in Jesus Christ that we now will enter into a relationship with Him that will never end. With this framework and with what Jesus is pressing on the disciples as they're hearing this, look at what He says in verse 31. As we're looking at this particular judgment day that will occur at the end of the tribulation period. He starts off looking particularly at the judge of judgment day. And he says, when the son of man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then... He will sit on the throne of his glory. So point number one, as we think about judgment in particular, as we think about, you might want to call this the sheep and the goats judgment. What's happening here is this is at the end of the seven year tribulation period. And Jesus is now at this point, setting up his kingdom on earth. So this will be a time where Jesus will be king of the earth. This will be a time where his rule will be established on earth. This will be a time that is a time of harmony, a time of, you might want to use a, a secular term, utopia. This is heaven on earth in a sense this is a physical earth and a, and, and a physical kingdom that comes to earth so it, it'll be here there will be real people but there will not be sin that will be uh, allowed to have any opportunity to cause all the problems that it's causing in this world so it'll be no sin satan will be chained up and his angels, the, the demons, the fallen angels, they will be chained up. The church, those who had been raptured and come back with him, they will be part of ruling over this kingdom. And so this will be a physical kingdom. This will be here actually on the earth as we know it. This will be a time where the animals, wild animals, will live in harmony with people. This will be a time where you can have a pet lion. You could have a, a pet alligator. I don't know if alligators are going to make it. I don't know if they're saved or not. <laughs> this, is, this is going to be a time where there will be no more wars. This is going to be a time where there is just, for a thousand years on the earth, it's, it's going to be like the Garden of Eden. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be beautiful. It's, it's going to be beyond what we can imagine. And the church will be in that with their glorified bodies. So we'll, we'll have these glorified bodies. So we, we won't go through sickness and disease. We'll probably be able to uh, teleport. You know, if you want to be in Hawaii, you can just be in Hawaii just like that wherever you like to go, it's going to be amazing. So that's an aspect of our future still. But see, there's going to be those that go through the tribulation. So, so the church is taken out, and then for seven years, and in particular, the last three and a half years of that seven years, the world is going to experience turmoil and trouble and difficulty like it. it's never ever even come close to having before. This will be a time where the Antichrist will rise up, especially in the three and a half year mark, where he commits a, a something called the abomination of desolation. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, Daniel tells us all about this. And that's when the Antichrist, who the Jews will accept, or the nation of Israel will accept as their Messiah, he will turn on them, he will, in their temple, which will be built in the future, he will cause them 
force them, make them worship him or an image of him. They will have to bow down to him. And in order to function in society, you or a person, hopefully not you, you will have to bow down and worship the image of the beast, the image of the Antichrist, and then you'll receive a mark on your hand or your forehead, and it'll be the number of man, 666, and you will need that to function in society. You will need that to buy things, to sell things, to get a job, to get a driver's license, to go to school. Every, you'll have to have that. In order to get that, you'll have to worship the Antichrist. If you worship the Antichrist to receive that, your fate is sealed. You can't repent anymore. You can't go back. And so during this last three and a half year period, all literally hell is going to break loose. And the Jews are going to recognize and realize at that moment that Jesus was their Messiah. And many Jews will turn and receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. You might, you might say, how are they going to do that if the church isn't here? It's because God is going to call, anoint, and seal 144,000 Jewish supernatural evangelists that are going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And not only that, there are going to be angels soaring back throughout the earth preaching the gospel. And not only that, there's going to be two witnesses that are also going to be preaching the gospel. It's all found in the book of Revelation. But see, during this time, people are going to get saved. Many of those people that get saved will be killed for their faith. They are called tribulation saints. It's not the church. It's different. The church is in heaven. And they will be martyred for their faith and killed. And they will go on to be in heaven. But some will make it to the end. Some will make it through all these catastrophic events. Some will make it through all of the judgments and all the persecutions and all the attacks. They'll make it to the end of the seven years. And then Jesus will come back. Some of those who make it to the end will not be saved and still will be rejecting God. Others will be saved and still be around and not be killed. And it is this group of people that is being dealt with here. Do you guys get all that? So now with that framework, watch, watch I just want to look at a couple things in regards to the judge now. So notice it says when in verse 31. It says when. So that's not an if, that's not a conditional, that's not a, a maybe... This is when. It's not an if, it's a when. So when the Son of Man comes, and that, that term, the Son of Man, is used here because this is the most humble reference or the most humble phrase as to who Jesus is. This refers to the humanity of Jesus. This refers to his incarnation. This refers to Jesus, the eternal creator of everything, taking on a human body, coming into this time-space continuum in order to live the life that we couldn't live, sinless perfection, so that he can pay the price that we couldn't pay on the cross. So when he uses this term, it's interesting because now what you're watching unfold is the incarnation, which Christmas is coming up soon, so this is a good Christmas verse. The Son of Man, the incarnation, the eternal God coming into the world, the humility, the compassion, the lowliness of Jesus Christ being able to identify with us as human beings, understanding the pressures that we feel, that we go through with, with uh, being in this world and with sin and, and all the emotions and the feelings, that this, this is a term that describes that aspect of him. But notice this humble, lowly 
riding in on a donkey. Man who had no place to lay his head. He didn't have a home. He didn't have riches. He didn't have surplus, but yet he was the one who became poor so we could be rich. It says, now he comes in his glory. I love that. Because now we're seeing this whole other aspect. Now we're, we're seeing this, this Jesus that we've seen through the Gospel of Matthew. We've been going through the book, I don't know how long, but for quite some time now. We have seen the humanity of Jesus and His first coming, which, which we are looking at. He came one time already, and He came like that, but He's not going to come like that again. The next time he comes, he's going to come in glory. The next time he comes, he's going to come in power. The next time he comes, he's going to come and he's going to take the government on his shoulders. He is going to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he is going to establish his rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years. He's going to come in glory. It's not going to be like a lot of people think where they could badmouth Jesus and they could uh, put him in a box or a corner and you know, disrespect him and dishonor him. It's not going to be like that. Jesus is going to come back and he's going to come back in glory and it's a when he comes back. And for homework, we don't have time to get in this, into this this morning, but Revelation 19 and Zechariah 14 has some really powerful scriptures in regard to this. But when he comes back, it says, Now all the holy angels, and notice that, that term holy, because that, that feeds into this understanding of his glory, of his judgment, of his power. And he's going to come back with how many of his holy angels? All of them. He's setting up shop on the earth. He's taking back the title deed to the earth that we lost in the Garden of Eden through our ancestors when we gave dominion over to Satan in the fall. Since then, earth and mankind has been experiencing the pain, sorrow, and trouble of the fall of fallen humanity and a fallen of a fallen earth, of fallen societies and fallen civilizations, fallen thought process, processes, fallen answers to problems. It's just all messed up. But it's not always going to be like that. Jesus is going to come back, Revelation chapter 5. He takes the scroll, which is the title deed, to the earth, and he opens it. This is Jesus taking back the title deed to earth who, now, who Satan now has, which Satan now has. So in Revelation 5, Jesus takes it back. And then in Revelation 6 through 19, it's a process of Jesus bringing it under his rule and his submission. So that's what that is. But all the holy angels. So Jesus is coming back in glory. All the holy angels are coming with him. And guess what? Thank you. Guess what? We, the church, are coming with him. So we get raptured out. We'll be in heaven enjoying fellowship with Jesus Christ. And at the end of that seven year period when all hell is breaking out on the earth, we come back with him to rule and reign with him on earth. So the holy angels, the, the church who has been in heaven and Jesus Christ himself, they come and look what he does. He will sit on the throne of His glory. He'll sit on the throne of His glory. Where is He going to do that? Do you know we actually know where He's going to do that? He's going to do it on Mount Zion. He's going to do that on 
Mount Zion, which is Jerusalem. Which is a real place which you really can go to, and Lord willing, we're planning on going in 2022. And Jesus, it says in Zach, that Zechariah verse I gave you, he's going to come, and he's going to go on the Mount of Olives, exactly where he's teaching the disciples this message, and exactly where he previously rode in on a donkey, and he's going to come different than riding in on a donkey. He's going to come in power and glory, and he's going to stand on the Mount of Olives where he's actually teaching the sermon, and it's going to split in half. And Jesus is going to proceed on into the city of Jerusalem through the east gate, and he's going to sit on the throne of his glory. Do you realize this is actually going to happen? Do you realize as sure, actually more sure than you're sitting in your seat right now, Jesus is going to come back and sit on his throne in Jerusalem, in his glory, with all his holy angels, with the church, and he is going to rule over the earth for a thousand years. This is what we long for, right? And, and many people in the earth, Human beings now, we see in our country the chaos. They don't actually know it, but in a way, everybody wants this. Everybody wants a utopia, right? There's been always these movements of, of how to make the world a better place and, and all these philosophies uh, about nirvana on earth. and the, we, you know, we want that, but we, we know it's messed up and we really can't find the solutions. And you know what? There will never be a solution until Jesus comes back. Did you know that? There, the earth is never going to get better. There may be pockets of civilizations and societies that are improved, but not until Jesus comes back and sits. And I like that, that image of him sitting because it shows his total control. It shows that, that you know, he doesn't have to arm wrestle to try to get the earth back. When he comes, he sits, and he is in all authority and all power, and he is calm and rested because his plan that he set in motion from the foundation of the world is happening, and it's happening now. So that's the judge on Judgment Day. We move to the judged who are the judged on Judgment Day? Look at verse 32. As we, as we think about this scene and the, the, uh, just the amazing thing that's happening, now as Jesus is seated, all the nations will be gathered before him. Did you know there's not a way around Jesus? There's not a loophole there's not another way. And in fact, all roads do lead to Jesus. Did you know that? Every human being will stand before Jesus. He is the door. He is the gate. He is the, the, the one who opens up the gate. It is Jesus that is the entrance into eternity. And Jesus proved that and established that. And that was the message of the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew, Matthew portrays Jesus as the king with the kingdom. And now he's telling us, Jesus himself, he is the king with the kingdom. And later his kingdom will come. And this is how it's going to go down. And every knee will bow, every tongue will will confess before him that Jesus is Lord. Did you know that? But did you realize at that moment where every knee bows and every tongue confesses, at that moment, not every knee that's bowing and not every tongue that's confessing will do that to eternal life. Why? Do you remember? I told you that that is decided here. Not then. Then it's too late. Now is the time. 
And if we bow our knee to him now and confess that he is Lord now, then that will mean that we will do that for eternal life. But there will be others that will do that to eternal condemnation. So what's happening here, remember, this is the seven-year tribulation period. Many people have died. The earth has been in chaos. The Jews have been persecuted and chased. And in reality, believers, all the believers are being persecuted, many of them dying. But as they make it to the end, some make it to the end. And at the end of the tribulation period, when Jesus comes back, what he's going to do is all those who are on the earth are going to gather before him. And I, I like that, that thought. Everything is before him. If we understand that now, our life is before him. Everything is going to be before him. And as he gathers all those who are left at the end of the tribulation period, as he establishes his throne in Jerusalem, notice what it says. And he will separate one from the other. Do you notice how individual this is? There will be hordes of people but in those masses, in those hordes of people, individuals will be separated. One from another. And he says, it'll be done like a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. How does a shepherd divide the sheep from the goats? In the area of Jerusalem... And around there, they would have shepherds. If you go, you'll, you'll see them. They, they walk through the desert areas and through the hills, and you'll see all the sheep and goats following them. It's quite a sight. As they travel together, they all travel with the shepherd. But at night or at feeding times, because of the difference between goats and sheep. The shepherds would have to divide them because sheep are more docile, relaxed, and peaceful in general. Goats are more active, rambunctious, often rebellious, and harder to manage. So when, when they feed, they have to separate them. And at night, when they sleep, they have to separate them. And Jesus is saying, when I come back again, my second coming, when I come back to the earth, all the nations, all those on the earth that are still left, I'm going to gather them before me, and I'm going to separate sheep from the goats. And notice, whatever you are at this point, that's what you are. You're either a sheep or a goat. That's all you are. There's nothing you can do at this point to change that. And you can see I'm emphasizing that because that is what is being emphasized here. And here's a huge point. I, I, I feel like this is what Jesus is really trying to get our attention about. And I really feel like as, as I've been praying and studying, I, I feel that this is what Jesus is pressing right here. He's pressing the fact in what we're looking at and in the previous parables, the parable of the talents. And before that, the parable of the ten virgins. The, the parable of the ten virgins, they were basically they were the wedding party of the bride. And so they all kind of looked the part. They all dressed the part. They, they all had the torches. They all had the wire mesh around the torch. They all had the cloth in the wire mesh. But five of them had oil and five of them didn't. 
And when the bride came, five were, were ready, five weren't. The five that weren't ready, they didn't have the oil. And they started to scramble to try to get the oil, and it was too late. The door was shut. The message, though, and, and this is the thing that is really heavy on my heart, is that the kingdom of heaven, now as it is on earth, it's a spiritual kingdom. We haven't, Jesus hasn't come back and established his kingdom yet. But it's this idea of mixture that we keep seeing. This idea that, that there are, are people around the things of God. There are, are, are people that do some things that would look like they're things of God. There are people that, that even say they are people of God, that say they're believers of God, that say they're followers of God. There, there, are, there are people like that, but, but they don't know Jesus personally. They're, they're, they're a goat, not a sheep. The one identifying factor in the parable of the virgins was the oil, and that's the Holy Spirit. So first from that parable, we see that the Holy Spirit is the deposit, the guarantee, the sign that somebody's truly born again. And what that means is, in Matthew 18, right in the beginning, it says, unless you are converted, and he says, like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. This is what Jesus is driving home. You can't just know about the things of God. You can't just rub elbows with people of God. You can't just attend events or even serve. And, and what we're finding out, you could even serve, even be an elder, even be a pastor and not be a child of God. That's what's being pointed out here. What's being pointed out is make sure that you're truly converted. Make sure you're not the same person anymore. Make sure something has happened in your life when you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, where you have a desire for Him, where you have a hunger for Him, where you desire to obey Him and to follow Him. And don't think that if you don't have those desires and don't care, don't presume that you're truly born again. That's what this is saying. This is what the danger is. Is presuming you're saved when inside of you, you love the world more than you love God. So then in the parable of the talents, that's the second one. Then he drives home this, this point. We have to understand this point that he's driving home. And he, he's saying that, each human being is given a talent, which means every human being on earth is given a spiritual opportunity to use what God has given them to grow in their relationship with Him. So there was one, he received five spiritual opportunities, and he actually used those spiritual opportunities. And what happened? He brought back five more of those spiritual things because he used those spiritual things. And what did Jesus say? Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things. Now enter into the joy of the Lord. And then there was a, a person that had two spiritual opportunities. They used those spiritual opportunities and brought back more Spiritual fruit or spiritual things. But then there is the one. This is the distinction. There is the one that received a spiritual opportunity. And in their thought and mind, they weren't interested in it. And it, it doesn't say that they just straight out rejected God. It said just whatever God gave them, they didn't care about it. So what did they do? They buried it. And then when Jesus came back, they said, here's your thing. Here's what you gave me. And they were proud of that.
But they buried it. They didn't exercise it. They didn't use the things that God gave them. And they just proved that they weren't a child of God. But how many people, for some reason, they think they were sprinkled when they were a baby, when they couldn't even remember it, or even if they went to a youth retreat and they are baptized. Those are all good things, but genuine faith manifests itself in actions. It, ma it does something. If you're truly born again, you truly have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, do you, do you think you'll just do exactly the same stuff you used to do? There's a problem with that. And this is what Jesus is saying. So now he's separating them one for another. The shepherd divides sheep from goats. And look in verse 33. And he will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left hand. And the right hand would be considered the hand of inheritance, the hand of blessing. So the judged, in one sense we can say all of mankind who have ever lived will face a defining moment. Whether it's taking our last breath here on earth, whether we go in the rapture, but, but now's the time to decide and there will be all a settling of what we do now. There will be a settling of that. There will be an account reckoning of that. So the last part, we looked at the judge, we looked at the judged, now let's look at the judgment. So it says then, notice it's sequential, when you see words like that, then. It, we started off with a when, W-H-E-N, right? So he says when this happens, it's almost like domino is falling. When this happens, then this happens. Now we're, we're in this chain reaction of unstoppable events it says when the king notice it's not saying the son of man anymore then the king will say to those on his right hand come you blessed of my father literally that means my father's blessed ones So that means that as the millennial kingdom begins, those who have rejected God all the way to the end, they can't go into the millennial kingdom. But those who have made it to the end, now God receives them. And I almost get this, this picture like a, a parent grabs a little toddler's hand and says, Come, enter in. To the joy of the Lord. And that's what the, the millennial kingdom, it's a good description of the millennial kingdom. It's the joy of the Lord. And once this moment occurs, it's done. Once this event happens and that person enters in to the millennial kingdom, they're etern they're just now they're never going to have to struggle again. They're never going to have to cry again. They're never going to have to be depressed, frustrated, discouraged, disappointed. None of that is never, ever going to happen again. And notice what it says. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So that's it. But notice what he says next. This is where it gets really interesting. For. So now he's explaining why they got to come in. And this is where, from chapter 25, we, we get the, the third proof or the third evidence that we're truly right with God, truly born again, truly saved, that it's not just a mental uh, assent or agreement, but that were truly transformed. The first one was the Holy Spirit. The second one was that we are anxious to use the spiritual opportunities that God has given us. And here's the third one. Jesus says to those going into the kingdom, He says, 
He says, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. That's why. But then the, the righteous, and I want you to, to notice that word, the righteous. Because the Bible makes it really clear how we are made righteous. Right? Judgment comes on the unrighteous. The righteous are those who have already been judged on the cross. In other words, Jesus' righteousness, His perfection as He came into the world as the Son of Man, was able then to take our place in judgment as He did on the cross. And now we, by our faith in Jesus Christ and on what He has done, we have been made righteous. He has given His righteousness to us. So the righteous, they say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? When do we do that? It's interesting. They didn't even know they did all that stuff. They don't remember ever seeing Jesus in those conditions and they don't remember doing those things for Jesus. And here's what Jesus says. Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it. So th this, this is an active thing, right? This isn't a passive thing. When somebody's truly born again, they, they actually do things actively. And that's important. He said, you actually did it, those things you just mentioned, to one of the least of these my brethren. You might want to circle that, the least of these my brethren, because that's the interpretive key to the whole thing. The least of these my brethren. So one may think, if I feed the homeless and help someone with the flat tire and the biggest one, help somebody move, <laughs> then God will accept me into the kingdom. If I do, then I'll be in. It's exactly what he's not saying. Exactly what he's not saying. Now, those things, of course, are good, but here's what's so important. What he is saying is, when he's talking about you did these things to one of the least of my brethren, what he's saying is how we interact and treat those who are the body of Christ. That's what's so important. So when Jesus re refers to my brethren, he's always referring to, to those who are in his family, to those who are part of the kingdom of God. And what he's saying is, now the, the evidence that we know that when we stand in judgment and we will pass the test, it will be because we naturally are part of the family of God through our new birth in Jesus Christ. And because of that, someone will naturally have an affinity for the body of Christ. Someone will naturally have an affinity to want to support, help, build up, encourage, and further the body of Christ. What's the body of Christ? It's people that are believers. So now just if we can take this a little, walk this a little back and make the application to us now, because this is not referring to the church because the church is gone, but it's referring to believers in the, in the, in the same sense. But now for us, here's, here's what happens with us. So if, if someone says that they're a Christian and they're presuming on their salvation and yet they don't have this unusual tenderness and affinity for the body of Christ. And in our context, we would probably most see that 
in a church body or a church gathering or a, a local church that we participate in. So the danger here is if we think, say, feel, and presume that we are going to be a sheep, but yet we don't have this tenderness, care, desire, attraction, affinity for believers in the body of Christ, then that's something we really need to check our heart about. It's a weird thing that happens when we become born again. We just long to be part of a church body. Long to be around all us weird people. <laughs> long to serve, to stir up our gift, to, to help, to pray for, to care for. And again, that's not to exclude helping and caring for those who are not in the body of Christ. But what this is particularly saying is that somebody who's truly born again, something happens in their heart where they feel connected to other believers, where they want to serve, where they want to help, where they want to contribute their finances to, to further the work of the kingdom. But if there's none of that in a person's life, and a, a person in our day and age, they, they have to have the perfect church at the perfect meeting time with the perfect dressed people and the perfect pastor and the perfect pastor that goes the perfect length of the perfect sermon that doesn't perfectly step on anybody's toes and well maybe I'll go then See, that's the mentality that's out there you know what and, and so uh, you know we find all of those you know what that's the, the there's something happens in our heart when we become born again, we just love the body of Christ. We, and, and when we're doing this, we're, we're actually doing it to Jesus. Right now, as you're you know, listening to me, you're doing it as unto the Lord. When you're, you're blessing Jesus because you're listening to him speak his word. When, when you pray and love and call and text and encourage, you're doing that to Jesus as you do it to the body of Christ. And your desire to do that is proof that you're truly one of his. Isn't that amazing? But we live in a time and a culture, and I gotta hurry up, but it's not gonna be the perfect time. <laughs> but we li live in a time, and we know this by scripture, and, and I wanna do everything I can to press this point because this is so important, and we know this is actually a fact that there is, there's going to be many people who think they're saved and they're not. And they're presuming on a time where they are sprinkled or baptized and they, you know, attended church when it fit their schedule and they're presuming on those things. And what we're seeing is if you don't love the body of Christ and, and you know, want to be involved and want to encourage and build up and bless, then that's a sign something's wrong. You better be very sober-minded because we live in a time where people fit church into what fits into their life. And that's, that's completely wrong. Now remember, the church is gone, so that's not particularly... But I, I'm going to go back in the text here and finish up. But in the same vein, what it's saying is those in the tribulation period that are caring for one another, caring for believers. So we can, instead of using the word church, we can use the word believers. Those are the sheep. They care. They're involved, they're helping, they're, they're serving, they're, they're part of it. And so that's an evidence here that they're a sheep and not a goat. But look at verse 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, and I don't think that's a political statement, but <laughs> just kidding. Those on the left hand, it was just a joke, relax. Depart from me. So this this. This right here, this word, these three words, these three words are what I would be willing to give my life for. That someone wouldn't have to go through this. This is, willing for, this is something for me that I would be willing to sacrifice everything. So this would never be said to anybody that I come in contact with. Depart from me. This is real. This is really going to happen. You cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Do you notice 
The sheep had a place prepared for them that God prepared for them. This is something prepared for the devil and his angels. That those who reject him will stand before him one day and he'll say, depart, there's where you're going to go. And then he gives the reason why. For you, for, I'm sorry, for I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. You basically didn't care to participate, to help, to, to build up the believers. You didn't care. And that was a sign that they are not truly part of the family of God. Verse 44, it says, Then, notice the sequence, Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, a stranger, naked, sick, or in prison? And notice this word. Look, look at that word. And did not what? Minister. See, that's the key word. Minister is where we get our word for deacon. It just means to attend or wait on. So somebody who's truly born again is going to naturally, because of their born again nature, want to attend to the people of God, to wait on like a, a waiter or a server and, and care for and, and be a part. And people who don't do that, he's saying that's the sign. You have to get that. You can't just think, I'm good. But a sign is you're, you're, you're truly concerned and desiring. But someone who's not, that in this case, is the evidence that they truly are not part of the family of God. So let's finish. In verse 45, Then he'll answer and say, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do, so they didn't do anything. To one of the least of these, you didn't care, and you, therefore you did not do it unto me, proving that you didn't truly believe in Jesus Christ and you weren't truly born again, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, and, or I'm sorry, but the righteous unto eternal life. Heavy, huh? We still have two minutes, and we're going to take communion this morning. That means we're probably going to go a little bit over, but not much. And I think this is important this morning that we take a little time and digest this. And I hope that as you're digesting this, that you're feeling so thankful. Because something so weird does happen to you. That you, you desire and long to not only be a part of a body of Christ, but to use and stir up your gifts and to care for, nurture, and be a part of true Christians and part of that Christian family. And so that's the assurance. We have the Holy Spirit. We have spiritual opportunities. We use them and, and God does great things through them. But then we just have an affinity for the body of Christ. And maybe some of us this morning, maybe we need to, to say, maybe I'm just presuming I'm saved. Maybe I'm just telling myself I'm saved. Maybe I'm just thinking God's a God of only of love, not of justice. And God couldn't be more clear. These are words of Jesus himself. He's saying there's going to come a time of judgment day. And for those who are His, now we are truly free to live our life for Christ on earth, knowing the best is yet to come. But those who don't have to wrestle and deal with these issues, and I hope and pray that you will come to a place where you realize your lack of desire and affinity for godly things might be evidence that you're not born again. It might be. I don't know. But it's definitely something to check and make sure because there will be a time where it's too late. And so let's pray. And we're going to take communion. Hang on to the communion. We'll take it all together as a body of Christ.